So um, our main research in interest is to um, try to understand how viruses are handled once they enter uh, an organism and how antiviral immune responses are generated. And um, usually viruses uh, enter uh, adult organisms by breaching through the skin uh, or mucosal membranes. And if they are not contained at the site of infection by the innate immune response, they have the potential to spread systemically uh, through the lymphatics. Uh, before reaching the systemic circulation, however, they must first encounter one or more draining lymph nodes. And these organs um, are thought to have two functions. One is uh, they act as filter station, so they prevent the systemic dissemination of pathogens. And the second one is that they provide a specialized microenvironment for the generation of uh, adaptive immune responses. And the, and the way they accomplish these two functions is not entirely understood and is the subject of our investigation. And for those of you who are not familiar with the anatomy of um, lymph nodes, they are uh, encapsulated, highly organized uh, lymphoid organs that have um, a superficial cortex and a deeper medulla. And the cortex is subdivided into a superficial B cell area and, and a, a deeper T cell zone. And I'd like to point your attention to this area here, the subcapsular sinus, which receives unfiltered lymph from the tissues and is located just on top of the B cell follicles. And uh, in order to understand how viruses are handled uh, within draining lymph nodes upon peripheral inoculation, we have used um, mainly, but not exclusively, uh, VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus. Uh, a few words about this virus. Uh, it's um, a rhabdovirus, very similar to rabies virus in humans. Um, it's uh, acutely cytopathic. It's the prototypic cytopathic virus. Um, it's an RNA virus. It is um, 160 by 80 nanometers in, in diameters. It looks like a bullet by electron microscopy. And it has a single surface glycoprotein uh, that is tightly packed on the surface of the virus. And uh, we can uh, um, label this glycoprotein with fluorescent dyes and make these uh, viruses very fluorescent and use for imaging studies, as I'm going to show you. Um, there are different serotypes. Uh, we use mainly Indiana, but also New Jersey as control. And um, uh, this virus is um, uh, it's an arthropod-borne virus, so it's transmitted by insect bites. And uh, um, so it gets deposited under the skin. And, uh, and uh, it's a neurotropic virus, so the risk is that it can spread to the central nervous system and cause uh, paralysis and death of, of uh, mammals, including mice. Um, the gospel in the field of VSV pathogenesis is that you absolutely need antibodies for protection against this infection. However, if you look at the studies that were used to establish this dogma, they use the, mostly from Rolf Zinkernagel's group, they use the intravenous route of infection. And, and as I told you, this is a virus that is transmitted by insect bites. So, so the natural route of transmission is subcutaneously. And as I'm going to show you, there are uh, differences depending on the route of infection for, um, in regard to protection against this, uh, this infection. So the first thing we did to understand how viruses are handled within uh, peripheral lymphoid organs upon uh, inoculation is to uh, perform multifoton intravital microscopy on, on draining popliteal lymph nodes. Um, and we used um, um, a model that was established in the lab um, several years ago by Thorsten Mempel, and it consists in surgically exposing the popliteal lymph node, which is the smallest lymph node in the body and is located just behind the knee and it drains the, 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 the foot pad area. So we, we perform surgery in a manner that we try to avoid as much as possible damage to the lymph vessel, blood vessels, uh, or nerves. And then we can position uh, the mouse under uh, the microscope, um, and we can image the events uh, taking place in, in the lymph node. If we uh, fluorescently label uh, objects of interest, viruses, cells, and so forth, we can, we can see uh, their movement and their interaction with each other. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, multi-photon intravital microscopy, the idea is that um, a relative movement of the objective, of the lens, relative to the specimen, can yield a stack of optical sections um, we call them Z-stacks because they are in the, in the Z uh, direction. Um, and uh, typically in our settings, uh, we scan about 40 to 50 micron uh, of tissue and it takes about 15 seconds uh, to, to acquire a Z-stack. And we can repeat this over time. Uh, uh, typically our movies last about 30 minutes 
and we can at the end reassemble all these images uh, digitally in, uh, in uh, two dimensional projections that we uh, can play as movies and usually we play the movies at 225 times uh, faster than, than real time. So, so keep this in mind when, when you're going to uh, see what, what I'm going to show you. So in the first experiments we actually uh, fluorescently labeled VSV with a green fluorescent dye. We injected the virus into uh, the foot pad and we imaged right away in the draining popliteal lymph nodes what's happening once the virus entered the lymph node. And um, in, uh, if we look at the uppermost pole of the lymph node that has been optically sectioned, you're going to see the popliteal vein here, the lymph node capsule in blue that is identified by the second harmonic uh, signal coming from the collagen. The subcapsular sinus floor is in this area and, uh, and uh, underneath it uh, you're going to see the lymph node parenchyma. So if I'm going to uh, play the movie, you're going to see uh, minutes and seconds here and um, uh, the afferent lymph vessels comes from, uh, from this side and so as soon as I'm, um, I start the movie, as you see minutes after a virus injection, you see the virus comes in the lymph node from the afferent um, lymphatics and accumulates, fills the subcapsular sinus and accumulates in this very uh, patchy pattern. So um, to, to um, determine the uh, cellular uh, site uh, of VSV binding site in the lymph node, we uh, performed some experiments in which we took mice that express green fluorescent protein under the beta actin promoter, so all cells in the mouse are green, we ir uh, irradiated, literally irradiate those mice and reconstitute them with bone marrow coming from uh, wild type animals. So we generated chimeras in which all stromal cells are green, uh, such as uh, high endothelial venules in the lymph node or um, uh, lymphatic endothelial cells in the subcapsular sinus. Now again you'll see the uh, lymph node capsule in blue, now we can label the virus in red this time the virus is going to come from this side and if I, if I play the movie you see that the virus in red again fills the subcapsular sinus uh, with the same kinetics that I've showed you before but if we look at the um, um, uh, sections you can see that there's no uh, overlap between red and green meaning that the virus does not uh, get captured by um, stromal cells by, by, uh, but by hematopoietic cells which you don't see because they are black here. So, and uh, to make a, a long story short, um, we actually perform a lot of work to identify what those cells are and it turns out that they are uh, the subcapsular sinus macrophages. They are uh, myelid cells that express, among others, the marker CD169 and they live in the, in the, um, in the subcapsular sinus either uh, on the subcapsular sinus floor or as depicted in this cartoon um, they, they are in the B-cell follicles but they extend cellular protrusions in the lumen of the sinus. Thus they are perfectly positioned to um, um, capture viruses, to sample incoming lymph for the presence of antigen. Now there's another population, at least another population of macrophages in the lymph nodes which also express the marker CD169 but is located in the medulla and we've shown that also these macrophages are able to capture virus. However, um, they, they are phenotypically and functionally distinct from subcapsular sinus macrophages. Phenotypically because I've told you that they also express the marker CD169 but there are a bunch of different markers that allows us to distinguish between these two populations. One, for instance, is F480 or SINAR1 or uh, MARCO. They are all markers that are expressed exclusively by medullary macrophages but not by subcapsular sinus macrophages. I've told you that they are also phenotypically distinct because in our view they are sort of the dumpster of the lymph nodes. They would bind to anything that you inject in the foot pad, preventing their systemic dissemination. For, um, um, however, subcapsular sinus macrophages are way more selective in what they bind. For instance, if you inject latex beads or fluorescent uh, nanoparticles or uh, apoptotic cells or whatever in the foot pad, they would bypass the subcapsular sinus macrophages and accumulate in, uh, in the medullary macrophages. So um, in experiments that are, I don't have time to, to discuss uh, with you, we, we've also shown that these subcapsular sinus macrophages have also the ability to uh, retain on the surface uh, of their uh, membrane viruses for many hours and they are able to translocate um, this surface uh, retained virus across the subcapsular sinus floor for presentation to the, and display to the underlying uh, B-cell follicles.
And today I'm going to show you that they also have a third function in host defense against a, a neurotropic viral infection. So may I ask you? Absolutely. So does it mean that the cells that you are seeing labeled with the, with the, with the uh, flores, plural, the virus, are not properly infected cells? I'm going to show you later. Right now, this is a, a fluorescently labeled virus. So what you see is the fluorescence that you see comes from the virus. However, in experiments that I'm going to show you later, we've also used uh, reporter viruses, viruses that are not fluorescent themselves, but they carry uh, uh, EGFP as a transgene. So infected cells would start expressing GFP. So you would see also what happens what happens afterwards. Right now, what, I'm, what I showed you is just that these uh, cells are able to uh, capture virus. And what we know uh, is that they can retain it on the surface for, for long hours. They also are going to get infected, as I'm going to show you, but they also have this property. Because, as you know, B cells have to recognize antigen in its intact form. So, so, so that's the purpose they serve. OK, so um, we, um, to understand the role of these macrophages in, in uh, VSV pathogenesis, we performed some experiments in which we depleted them. And there are several ways of, of doing it, that. One is through the injection of clodronate liposomes in the footbed. Clodronate is a bisphosphonate that is relatively non-toxic in, in a free form. But when packaged into liposomes and injected into the footbed of these mice, um, it, it, they um, accumulate on, on these um, macrophages that phagocytose them. And so uh, the, the, the drug accumulates in, in the cytoplasm of these uh, cells and, uh, and they um, undergo apoptosis. So if we look seven days after foot pad injection of clodron liposomes, we look in the draining popliteal lymph nodes, we no longer detect the CD169 expressing lymph node macrophages. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the other phagocytic cell population of the lymph nodes, the dendritic cells, with the, which express uh, the CD11C marker, are not affected by this treatment. So it's rather selective. And this is a local and not a systemic effect, because if we look in the, in the spleen of animals that received clodronate liposomes in the foot bed, uh, we can see uh, the uh, CD169 expressing uh, counterpart of the lymph node macrophages. We can now uh, challenge this macrophage depleted mice with uh, a very low dose of VSV Indiana, 10 to the 4 plaque forming unit in the foot pen, a dose that is perfectly controlled by uh, control animals. And as you can see, 60% of clodronate uh, treated animals die. They die within 7 to 10 days after infection. And, and the reason why they die is this is, remember, a neurotropic virus. So they develop a hind leg paralysis and a central ascending nervous system pathology. And indeed, if you look at uh, the animals that start to become sick, you can actually culture live virus in the brain and the spinal cords uh, of these animals. And this is true also if we use a different strain of mice, uh, bulb C, in place of the C57 black 6 that I showed you before, or if we use a different strain of, of VSV, New Jersey, in place of Indiana, as I showed you in the, in the previous slide. So what is the mechanism by which these clodronate-sensitive cells actually come for protection? Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, clodronate might have all sorts of weird effects other than uh, depleting uh, macrophages. So the first thing uh, we ask is, is there another way that we can deplete uh, these macrophages that does not involve uh, uh, clodronate? And we took advantage of the fact that these uh, macrophages express low levels of CD11C and that there are uh, mice that express the diphtheria toxin receptor under the CD11C promoter. So if we give a single foot pad injection of diphtheria toxin in the foot pad, six days prior to analysis, we actually get a nice depletion of CD169 expressing macrophages, but dendritic cells are not effective. And this is true whether we look by flow cytometry or by confocal immunofluorescence histology. And why, why dendritic cells are not effective? There are several reasons. So people who work with these CD11, CDTR mice, they know that in order to deplete dendritic cells, they have to give a very high dose of, C of uh, diphtheria toxin. One trick that people use is to make bone marrow chimeras, so is to irradiate uh, wild-type animals, uh, give uh, bone marrow from CD11, CDTR uh, mice, and then uh, repeatedly inject uh, diphtheria toxin. The reason being, if you take a whole CD11, CDTR mouse and you give several injections of, of uh, diphtheria toxin, they die because probably CD11C is also expressed by astrocytes, and so it has uh, toxicity for the CNS. 
So, the, um, so in this case, I give a single injection of, uh, in the foot pad, not IV, of, of um, uh, diphtheria toxin, and the dendritic cells are spared. The other reason is the turnover rate. The dendritic cells are much faster in their turnover rate than the macrophages. So even if this dose has an effect on the dendritic cells, they come back within two to three days. So uh, if I use this particular regimen, which is a single foot pad injection of diphtheria toxin, we still have a nice depletion, but the dendritic cells are not affected. Yes? Is it localized to the draining lymph node? It is localized. It's just it just localized to the draining lymph nodes. Yes. So we have another way of depleting basically the CD169 macrophages with diphtheria toxin in these animals. And when we challenge these mice with VSV, we still observe lethality. So it's not a clodronate specific effect, but there appears to be a general role of these uh, CD169 positive macrophages in preventing lethal VSV infection. So how does this work? Well, we first ask, uh, where does this happen? Where is the site of enhanced susceptibility to lethal VSV infection? We sort of implied that the action of these macrophages is at the level of the draining lymph nodes, but actually we inject clodronate liposomes and, and, uh, and the virus in the footpad. So it could be that something changes over there that renders the mice more susceptible to infection. Or it could be at the level of the systemic circulation. After all, uh, I've shown you that these macrophages have a, have a, a sort of a filter function in that if you eliminate them, then you can get transition of virus from the footbed to the uh, blood. Um, let me tell you that, that this very low dose of infection, 10 to the 4 plaque forming unit in the footbed, we never detect system, uh, virus in the systemic circulation, either by plaque, uh, plaque assay or by real-time PCR. Uh, in control or macrophage depleted animals. Anyway, to formally rule out the possibility that, that the virus gets into the blood and that's uh, how uh, it reaches the central nervous system, we've injected the same low dose of virus, 10 to the 4 plaque forming unit, that kills macrophage depleted animals when injected into the foot pad. We've injected the same dose directly intravenously. So we bypassed the, system, the lymphatic circulation. And when we do that, there's absolutely no lethality whether you deplete macrophages or not. But there's yet another possibility that uh, cells in macrophage depleted lymph nodes would get infected by VSV and travel via systemic circulation uh, to the CNS, acting sort of a Trojan horse for virus. Uh, and to, to distinguish between uh, this possibility and the only alternative access route, which is uh, local peripheral nerves in the injected hind leg, we performed a sciatic nerve resection uh, in macrophage depleted animals prior to VSV infection. And as you can see here, sciatic nerve resection prevent um, uh, death from a subsequent challenge with VSV in macrophage depleted animals. So these two experiments together rule out the systemic circulation as, as a possible route by which VSV gets access to the CNS in macrophage depleted animals. What about the foot pan? The footpad is actually a possibility because um, when we inject clodronate liposomes um, in the footpad, we get a local inflammatory response, which is shown here. If we take CD45 positive cells isolated from the footpad of control animals, we just see um, CD11B resident phagocytes, and that's it. However, when we inject clodronate liposomes one week earlier, we, we detect um, an, an inflammatory infiltrate which is comprised mostly by neutrophils and inflammatory monocytes. So it could be that these cells somehow renders local nerves more susceptible to infection. Uh, but what we are trying to achieve with clodronate liposomes injection is the depletion of lymph node macrophages. And in order to do that, we don't have to necessarily inject clodronate liposomes in the footpad because the entire lower leg is drained in the um, popliteal lymph node. We can inject, for instance, the clodron liposomes in the calf, in the, in the back part of the leg, and, uh, and uh, leaving the foot but totally undisturbed, but yet obtain uh, an equivalent uh, depletion of macrophages in the lymph node. And uh, when we do that, we still observe uh, lethality after VSV infection. So this experiment rules out the foot but as a site of, of uh, uh, enhance susceptibility to, to uh, VSV infection and leaves us with the draining lymph nodes. So how does this work? Well, in order to understand this, we, we've uh, performed some staining on uh, whole popliteal lymph nodes with uh, a pan-neurotropic marker, beta-3-tubulin. 
So as you can see, uh, we were able to identify in the capsule and in the subcapsular sinus and medulla of these lymph nodes a rich network of uh, peripheral nerves. We can now infect uh, these um, lymph nodes, these mice, with uh, um, a reported VSV, as I was telling you before, a, a, a virus that is not fluorescent itself but carries EGFP as a transgene, so infected cells would turn green as they start replicating the virus. So, and when we do that, um, we actually see a lot of green infected cells, the nature of which I'm going to reveal you in a moment, but note that peripheral nerves in the lymph nodes are actually um, spared from infection. However, when we deplete macrophages and infect with the same reporter strain, you can note the uh, co-localization between the red and green signal uh, indicating that these uh, local peripheral nerves get actually infected in the absence of macrophages. Uh, so, um, macrophages seems to have a critical role in preventing infection of local peripheral nerves located in the, in the lymph nodes. So, how do they do that? Uh, one possibility is that macrophages do what they are known to be doing, which is phagocytose and, and destroy infectious uh, viral particles, in which case you would expect rampant viral replication in the absence of macrophages. So uh, when we checked for viral titers in lymph nodes, we see the opposite of what, you had ex what we had expected, which is much higher viral titers in control animals as compared to uh, macrophage depleted mice. So this is uh, viral titers in the draining popliteal lymph nodes, uh, 6, 12, 24, and 36 hours post-infection. You see replication in control animals, but we barely uh, detect any virus uh, in the uh, macrophage depleted uh, lymph nodes. Uh, so why is that? Because macrophages are early sites of viral replication. As shown here, again, we use the reporter VSV. And as you can see, in control macrophage-sufficient animals, you can see uh, um, viral replication in the subcapsular sinus macrophages. However, in macrophage depleted, you barely see any sign of, of, uh, of replication. You can see a higher magnification here in which you can appreciate that the two populations of macrophages that I've told you before that are known to capture virus, one is located in the subcapsular sinus, one is located in the medulla. Although both capture virus, the medullary macrophages seem to be refractory to infection, while subcapsular sinus macrophages readily replicate the virus. And the molecular reason of this difference is, is not known, and, and we are currently investigating this. And this is even a higher magnification where you can see that actually cells that replicate the virus are CD169 uh, positive succapsular sinus macrophages. So we can rule out the clearance by direct destruction of infectious virus. What about an indirect mechanism? This could be um, that macrophages uh, in help uh, B cell or T cell responses. So let's, let's look at the B cell responses. Um, again, we see the opposite of what we had expected, which is a, a whopping neutralizing antibody response in macrophage depleted animals, much higher than control mice. And note that this is a virus that is uh, spectacular at inducing a neutralizing response. So this, this response that we see here after clodin liposome injection is truly remarkable. And uh, Elena Tonti is my group, uh, is following up this, this uh, observation and, uh, and uh, she's actually discovered that uh, this has nothing to do with macrophage depletion, but there seems to be um, an adjuvant, an intrinsic adjuvant activity of, of clodronate, and she's currently investigating the mechanism by which this, uh, this uh, phenomenon occurs. But for the purpose of this talk, we can rule out B cells as a mechanism by which macrophages confer protection. Uh, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to show you data, but we've also carefully checked the T cell response in, in these animals, and it's not diminished. So this leaves us with the last possibility here, that the macrophages have some sort of innate immune function. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, perhaps, but uh, it, it, mm, it turns out that this activity is actually type 1 interferon production. And uh, um, so if we look in, in animals that have been depleted of macrophages and challenged with VSV, we see a 90% reduction in, in type 1 interferon, eight hours post-infection in the draining popliteal lymph nodes. So uh, we next turn our attention to who produces type 1 interferon. It could be that these macrophages, infected macrophages, produce type 1 interferon directly, or it could be that they help uh, other cells uh, produce uh, type 1 interferon, such as plasmocytoid dendritic cells, which are uh, long known to be a major producer of type 1 interferon in many conditions, including VSV infection. Um, so let me uh, tell you that 
um, clodronate liposome treatment did not diminish, uh, did not affect the number of plasmocytoic dendritic cells that are present in the lymph nodes. However, when we depleted uh, plasmocytoid dendritic cells with the monoclonal antibodies against uh, PDCA1, we actually decreased type 1 interferon production by about 50%. And combined depletion of uh, PDC and macrophages resulted in almost um, abolishing the type 1 interferon response. Note that the depletion of macrophages alone uh, has actually pretty much the, the same effect as combined depletion, suggesting that plasmocytoid dendritic cells, in order to produce type 1 interferon following viral infection, need actually subcapsular sinus macrophages. And uh, I'm not going to show you the data, but we've showed that actually plasmocytoid dendritic cells, unlike uh, subcapsular sinus macrophages, are not infected with this virus. So we figured that in order to produce type 1 interferon, they would have to relocalize to areas of the lymph nodes which contains virus for their recognition of, of uh, viral materials through the um, intracellular tor like receptor 7. So uh, we decided to take a look at this phenomenon by generating mice in which 30% of plasmocytoid dendritic cells express a green fluorescent protein, GFP. And so as you can see here in control animals, the vast majority of plasmocytoid dendritic cells are located in the T cell area of the lymph node which is here in black because it doesn't stain for a B-cell marker, B220, which is expressed only in B-cell follicles. However, when we infect mice with VSV, as I showed you before, VSV get captured in the subcapsular sinus and medulla of the lymph node. We see that plasmocytoid dendritic cells leave the T-cell area and localize to the virus-containing area in the subcapsular sinus and in the medulla of the lymph node. However, when, uh, and this is a, a closer magnification, a higher magnification that shows you plasmocytoid dendritic cells possibly interacting with the CD169 uh, positive subcapsular sinus macrophages. And this is even a, a higher magnification. Uh, however, when we deplete mice of macrophages, we, uh, the um, plasmocytoid dendritic cells fail to uh, relocate to the subcapsular sinus and medullary uh, area of the lymph nodes and they remain in the T cell area. And this is the quantification of what I've just told you. If we um, plot the percentage of plasmocytoid dendritic cells that are present in the T-cell area, we see that the vast majority of, control, uh, of PDCs in control mice are in the T-cell area. They uh, marginalize and get the subcapsular sinus and medulla in, uh, after VSV infection, but not if we deplete uh, macrophages. And um, um, so basically these data indicate that both uh, uh, infected subcapsular sinus macrophages and plasmocytoid dendritic cells produce type 1 interferon upon uh, VSV infection. But that plasmocytoid dendritic cells need subcapsular sinus macrophages in order uh, to do that. We next turn our, our attention to where type 1 interferon needs to act in order to uh, exert the, its protective, uh, neuroprotective activity. And, uh, and um, in order to do that, we took advantage of uh, type 1 interferon receptor knockout animals, which are long known to be uh, extremely susceptible to viral infection, including VSV. So if we take whole uh, knockout animals, they die uh, upon VSV infection, but they die, note, with a different kinetics uh, from that of macrophage depleted animals. They die within uh, three to four days after infection, and they don't develop the um, uh, slow central ascending nervous system pathology that starts with monolateral, unilateral hind leg paralysis followed by bilateral paralysis and, and, uh, and the virus that spreads uh, centripetally to the uh, central nervous system. These this mice just drop dead, suggesting that the mechanism is, is, is different. Um, if we generate chimeric animals in which hematopoietic cells lack type 1 interferon, we see a phenotype that is very similar to the fully knockout animals. However, if we generate mice in which stromal cells lack type 1 interferon, including uh, intranodal nerves, then we see a phenotype that is very similar to macrophage depleted animals in that the mice uh, die uh, very slowly, developing first uh, uh, ipsilateral hind leg paralysis followed by bilateral and the virus uh, spreading uh, slowly to the central nervous system. So this data suggests that type 1 interferon needs to act on both um, hematopoietic and stroma cells in order to exert its protection. So uh, to summarize this first part of the talk, uh, we can actually reconstruct the sequence of events that ensues following VSV deposition under the skin. 
uh, within uh, minutes uh, upon infection, the virus gets drained into, into the um, draining lymph nodes, where two populations of macrophages capture the virus and prevent systemic dissemination. One population is located in the subcapsular sinus, one in the medulla. And while medullary macrophages are refractory to infection, subcapsular sinus macrophages uh, readily replicate the virus, and in, 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 uh, in doing so, they also start producing type 1 interferon and the yet-to-be-identified chemoattractant that recruit plasmocytoid dendritic cells that migrate from the T-cell area to the virus-containing uh, sinuses of the lymph nodes. They both produce type 1 interferon and this cytokine is critical to prevent peripheral nerves from getting infected with VSV. Several uh, questions remain to be uh, answered, however, uh, and they include the nature of the chemoattractant that subcapsular sinus macrophages produce in order to uh, attract PDC, and they also include whether type 1 interferon needs, uh, prevents uh, infections or replications in peripheral nerves, and whether type 1 interferon needs to act directly on neurons or on accessory cells, such as Schwann cells. So we can summarize this uh, first part of the talk and conclude that sarcastral sinus macrophages have at least three functions in lymph nodes. They act as uh, what we call fly paper cells by preventing the systemic dissemination of lymph uh, pathogens. And in data that I didn't show you, we've also um, showed that they are the earliest uh, antigen presenting cells for uh, underlying follicular B cells. And now uh, I've shown you that they act as essential gatekeepers to the central nervous system. So uh, in, in the last part of the talk, uh, I want to go with you uh, through some data that, uh, that are not published and uh, um, that basically derive from an observation um, that macrophage depleted animals, as I showed you, die, and they die in face of a very high neutralizing antibody response. As, uh, as I told you earlier, the, the gospel in the field is that you absolutely need antibodies for protection against this infection. And the fact that we didn't see any difference between, uh, in, in, with regard to antibody titers between the animals that survive and the animals that went on to become uh, paralytic and die um, uh, prompt us to reassess whether you do uh, need uh, neutralizing antibodies at all to survive this infection. So uh, in order to do that, we took advantage of um, a, a recently generated mouse strain uh, by um, Stefano Casola in Klaus Rajewski's group, uh, which are called the DH-LMP2A DH mice. These mice are um, knockout for the entire IGH locus that has been replaced by the EBV-derived LMP2A protein as a surrogate survival signal. So this, uh, these mice basically have uh, B cells that are knockout for their BCR, B cell receptor, but they have a survival protein that allows them to develop into B cells. So they, they, have, they don't have antibodies, but they have B cells that do everything that B cells do, including migrate to the lymph node that perform all their function except secreting antibodies. And we compare these animals to animals that are um, deficient of B cells, mu and T animals, which lack antibodies and B cells. So we have B cell deficient animals and antibody deficient animals. Now, if we infect these two strains of mice intravenously, they, they both uh, die uh, with the same kinative of uh, macrophage depleted animals, and, uh, and, they, uh, and there's no difference between them. However, if we challenge these mice uh, subcutaneously, now we see that while B cell deficient animals die, as, as they have been described to do, now uh, antibody deficient mice survive exactly as do uh, um, animals that are uh, wild type, that have uh, antibodies. So uh, these data indicate that B cells have an innate antiviral role that is antibody independent. And the, fa uh, and the fact that uh, if we now deplete macrophages from these mice, we now see the same uh, uh, mortality rate and clinical course of B cell deficient animals or of wild type macrophage depleted animals. And the fact that if we do the same treatment in mu MT mice, we no longer, we not, don't observe an increase in, in lethality, suggests us that the difference between these two viral strains might lie in the lymph node macrophage compartment. So we decided to take a look at that. And also another observation is that, as I showed you before, a VSV replicates in macrophages that are located just on top of the B-cell follicles. And this suggested that these two cell types might have some sort of, of uh, communication, they might uh, cross-talk. So um, 
we took a look of the um, lymph node macrophage populations in these uh, strains of mice. And as I've shown you before, in uh, C57 black cis wild-type animals, there are two populations of macrophages, one located in the sacapsula sinus and one in the medulla. They both express the marker CD169, but there are a bunch of different markers that allows us to distinguish. For instance, in this case, I'm showing you the, the marker SINAR1, which, as shown here, is expressed exclusively by medullary macrophages, but not by sacapsular sinus macrophages. Now, DHLMP2A behave pretty much as wild type. However, when we look at the, uh, animals deficient of B cells, we see that this distinction no longer holds true, and both population of macrophages actually express the marker SINAR1 together with CD169, suggesting that there's not uh, anymore a distinction between, other than anatomical, between subcapsulas and medullary macrophages. And this is true also if we analyze this population of cells by flow cytometry. So if we gate on CD169 uh, lymph node macrophages and we uh, plot SINAR1, on the x-axis we see that in wild-type animals there are two populations of uh, macrophages with regard to SINAR1 expression, one located in the subcapsular sinus and one in the medulla. However, when we look at B cell deficient animals, they homogeneously express high levels of SINAR1, uh, and so they have a sort of homogeneous medullary uh, phenotype. And um, um, more importantly, uh, this is the quantification of this, and we have uh, overall reduction on the number of macrophages in B cell deficient animals, uh, but the most striking feature is that uh, virtually 100% of CD169 expressing macrophages have actually a medullary phenotype. And this is consistent with what um, Jason Sister has uh, recently published, that uh, the, the B cell uh, requirement for the, uh, um, maintaining the phenotype uh, of macrophages in the subcapsular sinus. But more importantly for us, this uh, phenotypic difference uh, between these two mouse strains translates into a functional difference. And this is um, evident not so much when we do um, experiments of capturing VSV, meaning that if we now label VSV with, uh, with the fluorescent dye, as I showed you at the beginning, we label uh, with Alexa Fluor 88 a green fluorescent dye VSV, and we inject it into the footpad and look 30 minutes later, we see that uh, MUMT have no problem in capturing virus. So if we quantify viral titer 30 minutes uh, after viral uh, injections, there's no difference among these viral strains in capturing virus. This is fluorescent virus. However, when we look at the replication using the reporter uh, VSV strain, now we see that while in wild-type animals or in DHLMP2A animals, we see a nice replication in subcapsular sinus macrophages. In MUMT mice, uh, which have only a medullary macrophage phenotype, they don't show, they fail to show replication of this virus. And this is quantified here on a log scale. This is viral titers eight hours after infection in the draining popliteal lymph nodes. You can see lack of replication in the absence of B cells. And again, importantly, this uh, lack of replication translates into an inability of uh, mu -MT animals uh, from uh, producing type 1 interferon uh, from, um, after viral infection. And thus, uh, type 1 interferon that I've shown you is critical for uh, prevention of infection of lymph node errors. Uh, so what is it that B cells do in order to maintain this neuroprotective uh, subcapsular sinus macrophage phenotype? Well, to make a long story short, it turns out that this is um, lymphotoxin alpha-beta. And so we, can, we have several ways of interfering with the signaling. One way is, is the injection of uh, lymphotoxin beta receptor Ig fusion chimeras. If we do that and if we treat animals for uh, two to three weeks, we can see that the uh, uh, macrophages uh, lose, uh, um, the subcapsular sinus macrophages lose their phenotype and start expressing the medullary marker SINAR1, as shown here or here at a higher magnification. And again, this has no influence on the ability of these uh, animals to capture virus. But when we look at replication in animals in which lymphotoxin alpha beta has been impaired, um, we actually see the lack of replication similar uh, to the B cell deficiency. And this is uh, the quantification, I'm sorry, is shown here. Uh, after uh, lymphotoxin beta receptor Ig treatment, the animals fail to replicate uh, VSV, uh, similar to uh, the absence of B cells. And, uh, uh, and this again translates into their 
decreased ability to produce type 1 interferon. Uh, if you see uh, one week after um, a treatment with the lymphotoxin beta receptor IG, they start losing uh, their ability and uh, by uh, two to three weeks this is uh, complete and it's very similar to B cell deficient animals or wild type animals that have been depleted of macrophages. And uh, we were also able to uh, precisely locate uh, lymphotoxin alpha beta production to B cells by taking advantage of uh, conditional knockout animals that lack uh, lymphotoxin beta exclusively on B cells. And we actually see the same that I've showed you before with the lymphotoxin beta receptor IG fusion chimeras, which is a lack of VSV replication and a medullary phenotype of uh, lymph node macrophages. And more importantly, when we challenge now these mice with VSV, uh, they observe the, the, we observe the same lethality that we had observed in macrophage depleted animals. So if we functionally inhibit lymphotoxin beta receptor or in B cell deficient animals as I showed you before or in animals in which lymphotoxin beta is uh, restricted, the lack of lymphotoxin beta is restricted to B cells, we see uh, lethality upon uh, VSV infection. Now the last bit of information that I want to give you is that I've shown you that antibodies are not important for protection upon VSV infection and uh, all that matters is type 1 interferon produced by subcapsular sinus macrophages. And we took this notion uh, a step further by um, uh, treating animals with uh, an antibody that depletes T cells and NK cells. So we actually can, uh, animals that lack already antibodies, we can get rid of T cells and NK cells and also and show that they are perfectly uh, fine and they survive VSV infection. So all you really need in, uh, uh, with this neurotropic viral infection is actually subcapsular sinus macrophages that will get infected by VSV and produce neuroprotective uh, type 1 interferon. Uh, so we can now feed in uh, B cells and uh, B cell derived lymphotoxin alpha into the picture and conclude that subcapsular sinus macrophage phenotype and susceptibility to VSV infection and protective function require constant contact with follicular B cells. That B cell derived lymphotoxin alpha is a key differentiation signal for subcapsular sinus macrophages. And, uh, and, uh, and so that we would like to propose that B cells have a, a critical innate antiviral role that is not uh, dependent on their capacity to secrete antibodies. And uh, let me thank and acknowledge the people involved in this work. Um, uh, first and foremost, my uh, mentor in Boston, uh, Uli von Andrian, where uh, I started this project, and uh, um, a very talented graduate student in the lab uh, with whom I share the credit with for most of these experiments. Tobias Junt, a former postdoctoral fellow who originally started the uh, VSV uh, project in the lab several years ago. And this uh, work is now continuing in, in my laboratory uh, at San Raffaele. Uh, where Elena Tonti especially and Angela Amabile has been very instrumental to this uh, work and very helpful and they are have now taking on uh, their own independent project and are following up on this uh, observation and uh, I'd like to thank our collaborators, the uh, people who paid uh, for the job and I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions.